Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. I'm in Western Rajasthan, adjoining the Thar Desert on a highway. On either side are sacred lands called Orans, which are rich in biodiversity, have water bodies, and are conserved by community. I'm on my way to Kitchen, a village where every winter, from November to February, some 12,000 demoiselle cranes gather. They fly in all the way from Mongolia and Siberia to this village. Why? Because they get food. Kichen is largely a Jain village, and the villagers here believe that the cranes are vegetarian. Well, the demoiselle cranes do love their shoots and grains, but they also eat insects and reptiles. We have been told to come at sunrise, and we arrive there in time to see flocks and flocks of demoiselle cranes flying in from the horizon. But instead of landing and going straight for the food, these birds uh, circle around for almost an hour. Their honks sound like the roar of a distant sea, according to Salimali. We watch them and wonder, what will it take for these birds to settle on the abundant bajra, jawar and other grains that have been laid out for them? Why are they not going straight for the food? The villagers say that it takes a langda or a lame crane to act as the leader. Maybe this is a legend, but anyway, after an hour, we see some cranes flying down and then more and more follow. The courtyard where these grains have been laid out is not large. It is about quarter the size of a football field and it's called Sri Pakshi Chugagar Sanstan. In order to feed these cranes over the four months, the villagers gather almost one crore of rupees. It's not a small sum. Because let's say a thousand cranes require 100 kilos of grains. And today, November 20th, 2022, the estimate is that 2,000 cranes will gather in the morning and an equal amount in the evening. In order to come here, these cranes undertake one of the most arduous migrations in the world. They fly non-stop over the Himalayas from Siberia and Mongolia to come here. There is an easier route through the Khyber Pass, but these, crane, these cranes have been genetically hardwired to make this particular route before the Himalayas even rose. So you can imagine they have been doing this for millennia. The demoiselle crane, whose Latin name is Gras Virgo, was named by Queen Marie Antoinette, or so the story goes, alluding to its damsel-like appearance. Although you could argue that with its white ear tufts and black feathers falling over its chest, it rather looks like a grumpy old man in a black tie. In the IUCN species list, the demoiselle cranes are of least concern. They have a wide range across some 47 countries, beginning in Morocco and Turkey, spreading across Upper Europe, that is the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and then in a Siberia, Mongolia, and Eastern China. The flocks that are in Upper Asia migrate to India, Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Madhya Pradesh primarily, and the flocks that are in Upper Europe migrate to Africa, uh, mostly in Sudan. Of the 15 species of cranes in the world, the demoiselle cranes are the smallest. They are about half the size of the Sarus crane, which also occupies India. And unlike many cranes that have naked patches of skin on their head called wattles, the demoiselle crane does not have wattles. It has feathers on its head. Its migration begins in late September, early October where flocks of about 400 gather in Siberia and Mongolia and experience this migration anxiety. Suddenly one night they take off in flocks and they fly about for two weeks, like I said, over the Himalayas till they land in India. And some of them fly non-stop, they fall prey to golden eagles, they die of exhaustion, uh, but many of them make it to India. Unlike herons which fly with their head tucked in, the demoiselle cranes fly with their heads almost eagerly stretched out and also with their legs stretched out. So in a way they look like a cross as they make their voyage to India. Once they reach Kichin too, they have a routine. 
After they have this feed in the morning, they fly off to the water bodies and salt banks that lie all around the village. They eat or rather they gobble up a lot of the small pebbles because they have eaten these whole grains and they need the pebbles to digest them, to grind the, uh, the grains as it were. Then they take a dip into the waters, in the waters surrounding Kichen. They may do their courting dances. They may cackle and quarrel and squabble with each other. And then they take off to what is called the Malharin, about 25 kilometers away. Um, and again, a salt bank where they roost for the night, standing on one leg as cranes do. This goes on every day between November and February. And suddenly one day in March, the entire flock of some I don't know, the numbers can be 12,000 to 20,000. The entire flock takes off from India to fly back to their breeding grounds in Upper Europe and Upper Asia. Okay, so Rajasthan has a tradition of hospitality. So naturally, when a guest flies 4,000 to 5,000 kilometers to reach their village, it is natural that the hospitable Rajasthanis would uh, fet and feed these guests. But how did it begin? Well, it goes back to the late 1970s, early 80s, when a young man who is now dead, called Ratanlal Mallu Jain, returned to Kitchen after working in Mumbai. He and his wife, Sundari Bai, started feeding the cra these cranes uh, from their own house. Gradually, the crane numbers increased. Then he started conscripting the villagers with uh, to, uh, helping him feed the cranes, and so it began. In 2009, he was given an award uh, for 40 years of dedication to these cranes. Um, sadly, uh, Mr. Malu is no longer with us, but the tradition that he has started still continues in the village. This is Sevara Mali a man in his 40s who lives in a modest home in Kitchen. In fact, we are standing on the terrace of his home which overlooks the courtyard where the cranes are being fed. He keeps meticulous notes about the cranes' arrival dates and departure dates, the number of them that congregate every day, and when they arrive, at what time that is, and when they take off. He says that he is not affiliated to any organization, and he does this out of passion. He also sees patterns. For example, um, after rising to some 2,000 birds, there is a dip to about 300 to 400 birds. And when we, when we asked him why, he says that some people started putting chairs at the corner of the courtyard in order to observe the cranes better, and this caused the cranes not to come. And later, when the chairs were removed from the courtyard, the cranes re arrived back again. Um, on this day, November 20, 2022, uh, Sevaram estimates that there are about 2,000 cranes that are, are in the courtyard. Um, he also has uh, done public interest litigations to remove the power lines that crisscross Rajasthan, causing the deaths of several cranes. He has this notebook in which he takes notes. He um, uh, clips all the articles about the cranes that, are, uh, that appear in um, Rajasthani uh, Patrika or other regional newspapers. He talks about tagging the cranes and taking care of injured cranes. Pretty much this is his life's work. So by now it has been half an hour since the cranes are feeding and the question becomes what are they going to do next? When will they take off? When will they finish? So we keep watching this amazing spectacle of cranes all flocking together, cackling together and fighting with each other. The Sanskrit word for crane is krauncha, which is sort of cognate with crane. And the krauncha formation has been referred to in the Mahabharata epic. Cranes fly in a V-shaped formation. And apparently on the second day of the Mahabharata, the Kurukshetra, the battle, both the Pandava side and the Kaurava side took a krauncha formation, a V-shaped formation to attack each other. In North India, they have various names including Kunj, Kurjan and so forth. People are very fond of these cranes, both the Dem Demoiselle crane and the Sarus crane. In fact, the Valmiki Ramayana originated because Valmiki spotted a hunter shooting an arrow and killing one of the male cranes that was engaged in lovemaking with the female crane. And Valmiki got so mad that he started um, uh, spouting poetry. 
so from his shoka or grief came sh- the first shloka or verse which had an exact meter so this is the legend anyway although the crane species that evoked valmiki's wrath and subsequent poetry was uh, s- said to be the sarasa crane or the saru's crane and suddenly without warning the entire flock of 2000 cranes took off clearly they've had their fill of eating and they took off to the horizon to go graze on the fields all around a little later or hang out by the water bodies it was miraculous to watch these creatures converge on the courtyard and take off because the fly in and the fly out were sudden and lots of us who were standing on that terrace speculated about what was the trigger that caused them to fly but nobody had a good answer these cranes for now are welcome guests in kitchen and bird podcast hopes they stay that way bird podcast is produced by ullas anand and echo edu i'm shobha narayan thank you for listening and thank you for watching